Hi, friends. I'm John Kempf, hosting this podcast. I am passionate about developing regenerative agriculture systems that improve soil health, produce crops that are completely resistant to diseases and insects, and produce fruit of such an exceptional quality that we can have a legitimate conversation about growing food as medicine. I've discovered that there are many people with incredible knowledge and information about soil and plant systems and how to develop regenerative agriculture systems. However, much of this knowledge and this information is scattered. It's found all over the place. Some of it has been published in peer-reviewed publications, but there are many incredible stories and a lot of knowledge that has not been published and that hasn't been shared with many people. I started advancing eco-agriculture in 2006 to bring this knowledge together in a more coherent fashion and incorporate it into products and growing systems that growers can easily put into practice. It's my personal mission to have these regenerative agricultural systems become adopted globally and become the mainstream, the status quo, against which all other growing systems are compared. To help achieve this goal, I want to share the knowledge that we have learned in the last decade and make it available to everyone. While we have developed products at AEA that embody the principles of regenerative agriculture systems and make them easier for growers to apply, this knowledge and these principles can be applied anywhere. And when they are applied properly, they will always increase farm profitability and resilience to climate stress. If you have any questions, suggestions, comments, or ideas, topics that you would like for me to discuss, please connect on LinkedIn or on Twitter, where my username is at VisionBuilder7. Or you can also email me at uh, john at johnkempf.com. I would very much like to hear from you and to hear your feedback. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast. And thank you very much for listening. Enjoy the show. Greetings, friends, and welcome to the Regenerative Agriculture Podcast. On this podcast, we explore the science and the practical application of regenerative agriculture ecosystem, how to regenerate soil health, crop health and quality, and increase farm profitability. Our goal is to give you clear, easy to understand, and actionable information that you can implement on your operation. In this episode, I'm very honored and very excited to welcome Gabe Brown to our show. Gabe, thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. Good to be here here, John. So Gabe, you have, you have a fascinating story about the work that you have done on your farm, the successes that you've had, and some of the changes that you've been able to make over the years. Um, what are some of your most memorable moments that led you to where you are today? Well, uh, I guess it all started back. I was born and raised in town. I wasn't from a farm or ranch, but took an interest at a young age and happened to marry a gal whose parents had a farm and, and uh, very conventional heavy tillage and use of synthetics, etc. But worked into that and was able to purchase it in 1991. But because I was not born and raised on a farm, I didn't have any of these preconceived notions. So I was open to new ideas. And I had a 1991, my wife and I purchased part of the operation from her parents. And 1993, I had a good friend of mine in the northern part of North Dakota who was no-tilling. And he convinced me and it didn't take a lot of convincing because it just made sense to me. In our rather semi-arid environment, we were trying to save moisture. He said, Gabe, you need to go no-till in order to save time and moisture. And that just made sense. But he also said, I'm going to give you a little advice. If you do it, he said, sell all your tillage equipment. Then you're never tempted to go back. And I actually did that. I had to sell my tillage equipment in order to be able to afford the no-till drill we purchased. And, and so that started me down the this path. But the biggest change in our life came about the years 1995 through 98. We lost two crops in a row to hail, then one to drought, and then the fourth year in a row, we lost a crop to hail again. And I tell people those four years of natural disasters were absolute hell to go through, but they were absolutely the best thing that could have happened to me because of the fact that financially, the bank wasn't going to loan us any more money. I had to learn, okay, how am I going to make a living off this land without uh, the use of all of these synthetic inputs? And so those couple of factors were were the biggest driving force in our move for 
towards regenerative agriculture. What were the key pieces that you changed during and after that four-year period that were substantially different from the way that you've been farming before? Right. Well, when you think about it, the, the first year, 1995, we lost 100% of our crop to hail. It occurred the day before I was going to start combining our spring wheat crop. Spring wheat was our major cash crop at the time. Well, we, we all of a sudden laid all this biomass down on the soil surface. So we got all this armor protecting the soil. Then 1996 come along, same thing, lost 100% of the crop to hail again. Again, laying down tremendous biomass and we're leaving all that, that soil intact. We're not disturbing that that uh, soil ecosystem. Well, because that, that hailstorm was so devastating, we didn't even have enough feed for the livestock. So I had to go in and seed like sorghum sedan grass and cow peas. And I was intelligent enough to know the value of seeding legumes with grasses and those simple things we can do uh, to benefit production and, and increase biomass. So I did that. Well, it got to the point where, where we were virtually <laughs> with no money. I couldn't afford to even put up hay. So we turned livestock into those acres and grazed. So this series of natural disasters was actually the best thing that could have happened from a soil ecosystem, soil funk standpoint, because we were lowering synthetic inputs, which which obviously uh, led to not as much carbon being uh, burned through because of the overuse of, of particularly nitrogen fertilizer. Then we weren't applying phosphorus fertilizers, so that led to a buildup in micro rise of fungi, along, of course, with no soil disturbance. So all these little things that nature was forcing us to do was actually advancing soil funk. So, so it was a period of events, and I tell people very honestly, I had no idea what a cover crop back, was back then. I had no idea about soil health, soil function, but just due to circumstances, we were going down that path. You've mentioned a couple of different pieces that you worked on that you incorporated, um, perhaps not by intention, but rather by default, that improved soil health, no-till, cover crops, livestock. Uh, a question that I've been asked on a number of conversations recently is, many people are beginning to recognize the value and the importance of cover crops, but there's still a lot of hesitation around incorporating livestock into agriculture ecosystems. So the question that I would have for you is, in your estimation, how important do you believe it is to incorporate livestock to the overall ecosystem? Mm -hmm. Well, that comes back to, let's step back and, and take a look at how these, particularly these prairie soils were formed. You know, they were formed over eons of time, large of time with large herds of bison, elk being moved across across the landscape by predators, trampling, grazing, and then defecating and urinating. And we had, you know, this natural nutrient cycling occurred. And then the animals would move on, long periods of rest and recovery, which allowed for maximum amount of carbon to be pumped into the soil. And, and you know, soil health revolves around carbon cycle. And so that's how our, our prairie soils were formed. Well, look what we've done in our monoculture type mindset. We've we've removed the diversity and we've removed the animals from the landscape. And now we're simply not pumping as much carbon into the soil. Now, can we advance soil health without livestock? Absolutely. I tell people I have several of quarters of land that we're just not able to graze livestock on, surrounded by housing developments and, and no water. And it's just not worth a hassle to incorporate livestock livestock onto those acres. We've still significantly advanced the soil health on those acres. However, the we will never have those soils to the point where we that have the soils that we're able to graze livestock on. And the the main thing, there, there's many benefits of having livestock on, on cropland. But the one thing I think producers are really missing out on is the profitability of doing so. I ran some numbers uh, after 2016 
and we added $220 net return per acre on the acres, cropland acres we were able to graze livestock on. And that's significant, you know, with margins where they are in commodity agriculture today, you know, what producer wouldn't want $220 more per acre? Now, I'm not saying all producers will want to go through the, the things we're doing with livestock, but in saying that, that they're missing a major opportunity there. You know, I tell people if, if you have the ability, you know, cover crops are an absolute no-brainer from a soil health standpoint. But if you can integrate livestock, that's a way to convert those cover crops into dollars. And I tell producers, even if you don't want to do it, there's many young people in the communities around the country who would love the opportunity and chance to run some livestock and enter agriculture that way. Why not benefit your resource, help a young person, and, and integrate some livestock under your crop plan? That's a great idea for incorporating the next generation. And also, when you talk about the the economics and the profitability, an additional $220 net per acre, uh, isn't that a larger net than most growers are getting from producing corn? Well, yes. I, you know, on our operation, we sell very few commodities. We're doing value added direct to consumers uh, simply because of the dollar return we can generate by doing so. But I just shake my head at commodity agriculture today and I ask the question, I have no desire to produce commodities and I really don't understand why people do. There's just no money in it unless there's a major drought somewhere or, or some external force. We we tie our hands, so to speak, when we produce commodities. And I, I'm just, uh, obviously by talking to me, you'll, you'll get to understand I am, I am not a proponent of the current production model. I think it leaves too many decisions in hands other than our own. I tell people we are profitable every year on our operation because we set our own price. We take that out of somebody else's hand, put it in our own. So when when you're able to do that, that just really adds to your bottom line and, and increases profitability significantly. When I think about the implications of what you are describing, there is this entire industrial ecosystem that has evolved to handle commodity crops. When you think of all of the um, combines and equipment, equipment manufacturing, logistics, grain elevators, and feedlots that have all evolved evolved to accommodate this commodity cropping mindset. What you're essentially describing is displacing, has the potential, in my understanding, to displace practically all of that, or at least the great majority of it, by bringing livestock back onto the land to graze crops and cover crops directly on the soil. And that that has some substantial ramifications, obviously, not only for long-term soil health on a, on a macro level, but also for the the agriculture industry as it exists today. Yes, you're right. And let's be honest, it's not going to change overnight. It's going to change slowly over time. However, the movement we're seeing, and I spend a lot of my time dealing with the human health health aspect of production agriculture. And, you know, we have a human health crisis in this country. America spends more on health care than any other country in the world, yet we lead the developed nations in cancer, ADD, ADHD, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, autoimmune diseases, obesity, and the list goes on and on. Well, why is that? Now, let's be very honest. I'm not, you know, I'm not in no way blaming it all on farmers and ranch. It's due to our sedentary lifestyle. But but a lot of it, uh, farmers and ranchers have to accept part of the blame because the nutrient density of the foods that we're producing is a fraction of what it was 50 to 70 years ago. So how are we going to change this downward trend in human health? It has to start with the soil and it has to start with the movement of nutrients through the ecosystem and inevitably ending up in our bodies. Well, you look at what's causing the downward trend in, in nutrient density in our foods, a lot of it is related to the health of our soil ecosystem. That 
I profess comes about from our industrialized, commoditized mindset. And so if we're going to truly affect human health, it has to start at the soil level and the ecosystem level and what farmers and ranchers are doing. Okay, then it gets back to using the principles of a healthy soil ecosystem, just what I talked about when we started about how we have to do what's necessary to advance the health of our soils, get more nutrients, plant secondary metabolites that are moving through the through the plant and then inevitably uh, into the human food chain. Well, we're not going to do that with commodity agriculture. And uh, just this past winter here, uh, I've spent a great deal of time with several uh, large organic companies working on regenerative protocols where they are actually driving change on their producers and their producers are going to be paid accordingly to the regenerative practices they do on their operation. And it all comes about because these large companies know that the next real wave that's coming, so to speak, is the focus on human health. So they're going to make more money if they have higher nutrient-dense foods. The only way they can get that is by improving the health of the ecosystem, soil ecosystem. And so, so it all comes about in a roundabout way, getting back to our system is broken with commodity industrialized agriculture. You know, farmers and ranchers get it beat into them. Oh, we got to feed the world, feed the world, feed the world. Well, the the there was some figures released here in December of 2016. 17 that stated we produced enough food on this world last year to feed 200 and excuse me to feed 14 billion people well think about that you know we have approximately 7.8 billion people in the world yet we produced enough food to feed 14 billion so farmers and ranchers are you know they're shooting themselves in the foot if they think they got to increase production to feed the world there's already enough production out there you know so the only way you're going to differ differentiate yourself from everyone else and to increase the value of what you're producing on your operation is you better be producing nutrient-dense food and then you have to set your own prices and be paid for it. And that's what we're trying to do on our operation. That's what we're encouraging others to do also. Gabe, you brought uh, up a number of absolutely fascinating points. Um, the there, there is this idea, even today, I mean, the, the numbers that you just shared surprised me a little bit. Um, the there is this perception even today that we're not producing enough even for the current world population and yet you're describing that in fact that's not the case we have we're overproducing much more than we need which essentially would indicate that we don't really have a production problem we have a distribution problem and i, I find that, that that is exactly right john um those figures you know enough to feed 14 billion people was the highest i heard i did uh, uh find several places that that stayed we've produced enough last year to feed 10 billion people. Uh, in saying that, oh, there's uh, over a billion people worldwide that, that go to bed hungry every night and don't have enough food. And it is exactly as you said, it's a distribution problem. It's not a product problem. You know, the other thing we have to be very honest and look at is a lot of what we produce does not go into human food consumption, you know, and, and um, a lot of it is going obviously towards things things like ethanol and then grain to feed uh, uh, cattle. And I will argue that, you know, I tell people I've I've slaughtered thousands of beef animals and I have yet to see one with a gizzard. So why are we feeding beef animals grain? It, it just, it does not make sense. Now, in saying that, I'm going to be very honest and tell you, I will eat grain-fed beef if, if grass-fed isn't available and it's still a, a highly nutritious, nutrient-dense product, but I will certainly uh, would rather be eating grass-finished uh, beef simply because of the health benefits of it, and I prefer the taste of it, quite honest. So we have to we have to look at all of production agriculture, what we're doing, and you know uh, <laughs> our soil health salting uh, partnership did a school in eastern Iowa, and and when we do schools in places like that, it absolutely amazes me the mindset of producers in thinking that. The only thing they can produce there is corn and beans. The only thing they can produce is corn and beans. There's not the infrastructure. There's not the market. And and I just um, um, really get a 
I, I'm disappointed by that, quite honestly, because that that shows you how in production agriculture we have such a narrow mindset and we close our thought process to other ops that we have that maybe would make us more money. And I think part of the problem is the current farm program. You know, let's face it, 95 plus percent, and that's probably on the light end, of cropping decisions are based on revenue insurance and what people can make off revenue insurance guarantee themselves. And I quit being involved in any farm programs a number of years ago because, for one thing, I I don't think the American public should be paying and subsidizing my operation. If I can't make it on my own, I shouldn't be doing it. The other thing is, why would I want to tie my hand and, and be limited to what I can do on my operation? For instance, in 20, here in near Bismarck, North Dakota, we've gone through a couple very dry years. And and when we went into planting last spring, uh, I had uh, planned on putting more corn in. But because we were so dry, I switched my my uh, cropping decisions accordingly. And due to that fact, I was able to, to uh, harvest crops that made me a decent profit last year, even though we only had 5.8 inches of rainfall during the growing season. You know, you tie your hands and limit yourself when you're in this commoditized, industrialized mindset. And producers need to uh, to learn how to adapt and observe and, and change uh, according to conditions. I've been fascinated by the mindset of growers, which you just described and re- referring to what you experienced in Iowa. Um, it's, it's intriguing to me that in the state of Iowa, any crop that is not corn and soybeans is classified as a specialty crop. I mean, alfalfa and wheat production are, are classified as specialty crops crops in Iowa. And when you go back um, prior to the freeze of, if I recall correctly, I believe 1946, prior to 1946, Iowa was sixth in the nation for apple production. It was a major apple growing region in the in the United States. Wow, and I didn't realize that. that. That climate still exists today. The climate hasn't shifted that substantially, but there was just one freeze that uh, in which they lost a lot of trees and the entire industry never came back. And so when you when you think of that, I mean, I'm using apples as one example, but there was a right. diverse agricultural ecosystem in Iowa uh, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. That has uh, they were also uh, north uh, north central Iowa was the flax capital production of the world, and uh, that that has completely disappeared. I shared with producers, and and don't get me wrong, Tony, it's not just eastern Iowa. I can go anywhere in the United States and list similar. Stories, but I, I shared with with attendees of our school. I, I shared uh, the net returns, average net returns over the past nine years on my operation. And my highest net returning crop per acre of my cash crop is cereal rye and hairy vetch combined in combination. Uh, over the past nine years, our average net return per acre is $951. Now, how many people out there grow rye and hairy vetch and then combine it and sell it? Well, not very many. Bingo. You know, I often tell people, People, people laugh at Gabe Brown because he's different. I laugh at them because they're all the same, right? Nobody <laughs> else is doing this. You know, it's just like uh, uh, my family and I have planted over 1,500 fruit and nut trees the past four years on our operation. How many peaches are being grown in North Dakota? You know what I can get for a North Dakota grown peach? Two to three dollars per peach. Why wouldn't I do that? You know, I, I just laugh at people with their closed mindset, you know, and also I think people don't realize, you know, here in, in, in the Midwest, we're somewhat isolated from what's happening on the coast. Well, in my traveling and speaking, I spend a lot of time on the East and West Coast and you get talking to consumers out there. It's absolutely amazing. I visited with a producer who is running a uh, 8,000 laying hens on past. He's selling his eggs for a dollar per egg, a dollar per egg. And he just laughs. He says, people can go to Walmart or wherever they want and buy cheap eggs, but I can sell all I want at a dollar an egg, you know, because people are willing to pay for it. Here in Bismarck, North Dakota, we run uh, 1,100 laying hens on past. You can buy eggs at the local store for less than 70 cents a dozen. We're getting $4.50 a dozen, and we can't even begin to keep 
keep up with demand because people, they, they see the difference when they crack those eggs open. They want to know where their food comes from. So people say, well, I'm not going to raise chickens. I don't want anything to do with that. Okay, don't complain to me. You're not making money. You know, this isn't rocket science. Then think of how we're, how we're feeding those hens. Well, I mentioned to you, we grew the rye and hairy vetch that I'm selling as seed. We run it through a cleaner, take out all the screenings. That's all we're feeding our chickens is screenings. So I'm taking a waste stream from one enterprise to fuel the profit in another. That's just good business. That's all. That's just good business then, you know. But so many people aren't willing to do these little things. And then they wonder why they can't make any money. Yeah, I've, uh, I, I also have many colleagues and friends that I've met in my travels who are doing similar things to what you're describing who are extraordinarily profitable. And uh, not only are they profitable, but they are finding a lot of joy and fun in the work that they are doing, which didn't exist before they stepped outside of the typical boundaries of doing what everyone else was doing. You're exactly right, John. And isn't it enjoyable to have people come up to you? And I've had people in their 60s come up to me and say, Gabe, agriculture culture is fun again. I'm enjoying this. We don't have the stress. My wife is happy. You know, we're not stressed out over over finances anymore. And, you know, I tell people, they may laugh at my chickens, but who doesn't enjoy sitting and watching a chicken? You know, I mean, it's a chicken. It's, it's not like it's much work and, and uh, it's enjoyable. I tell people, you know, I, I used to, when I was in my conventional quote unquote mindset, I used to wake up every day trying to decide what I was going to kill that day. Was it going to be a weed? Was it going to be a fungus? Was it going to be a pest? You know, I was going to kill something every day. Now I wake up, how do I get more life on my operation? And it's much, much more enjoyable working with life than death. That That is, you're, you're exactly right. I, in, in a series of seminars a couple of years ago, I asked farmers the question, why do you farm? What was it that attracted you to farming in the first place? And when you, when you begin unwrapping the answers and, and digging down into the foundational reasons, reasons that attracted growers to begin farming and to stay in farming, it is really because of their appreciation and their desire to have a connection to life and living process. Mm -hmm. Farmers really love watching seeds germinate in the spring. They love watching the joy of a newborn animal. And we have unconsciously adopted a model of agriculture that is directly antagonistic to those core values where we've adopted a model that is based on a warfare mentality of search and destroy, identify a specific pest or pathogen and figure out how you can kill it. And then, of course, if you're not successful with the first weapon of choice, you just get a bigger bomb and get a stronger pesticide. Yeah, right. And look where that's led us. You know, now we have weed, you know, weeds that are resistant to herbicides and et cetera, et cetera. And it's just leading us down this path of decimation of the ecosystem. But it also has human health ramifications. And I really think we as producers need to step back and look in the mirror and realize that that the things we're doing on our farm and ranch are impacting human health. And we have to take some responsibility for those, for our actions. Yeah, I think in many cases, we as growers may have lost sight of the fact that our primary responsibility is growing food. We talk about feeding the world, but it's become a very, very abstract concept where it's, for many of us, it's no longer real about actually connecting to the people who are consuming that food. It's easy to distance ourselves from that. Correct. I'd, I'd like to go back to speaking a little bit about beef production. Today, there is there is um, a great deal of dogma and a great deal of uh, political dialogue around how beef is bad. Beef is bad for the environment. Um, we are consuming too much beef. We need to reduce our meat consumption, and we're not going to be able to feed the world with if we continue to increase meat consumption and emerging developing countries, developing economies increase their meat consumption. And yet, this is a a very different perspective from the one that you've been describing where you believe livestock are actually an integral part of a regenerative agriculture ecosystem. So I have a few questions around that. I guess perhaps the one to begin with would be when when you think about quote unquote feeding the world, do you believe that it is possible if, if you look at well let me let me begin over again. Um, if you look at protein production per acre from a macro
macro perspective and being able to feed a growing world population a higher quality diet. Can we increase meat consumption globally and produce an equivalent or even greater amount of beef using the type of system that you are describing than we can with corn production and, and feeding grain the way it happens currently? That, that's a very good and pertinent question. Thanks for asking it, John. The answer is absolutely yes. We can increase, uh, uh, I'm going to say, meat protein consumption because it's not only beef, it's other other uh, species of livestock also. Look at what we're doing now in production agriculture. Animals are confined in lots, whether it be a feedlot, whether it be a large confinement dairy, whether it be hog production, find in buildings, poultry production, find in buildings, instead of having those animals out on the landscape. The issues that we're seeing, and you, you know, you, you often hear people demising beef consumption because of, of methane production. But what they don't realize and, and fail to take into account, there was actually more ruminants on North America pre-European settlement than there are now. Okay, if methane was is a real issue, we should have had higher methane emissions back then, right? No, the reason we didn't is because there's methanotrophs. And methanotrophs, organisms down near the soil surface, when a grazing animal emits methane, those methanotrophs latched onto it and used it as a food source, okay? That's not happening with animals in confinement. So the critics are correct in today's production model. But when we get out animals out on the landscape, there's many benefits to having them out there. You know, it's a proven fact that, that the biology in the soil, microbiology, is directly related to biology in the rumen and also biology in the human gut. You know, we have billions of bacteria and fungi in our guts also, so it's all tied together. Now, getting back to answering your question about about uh, adding protein and feeding more protein to, to people in the world. The current production model, okay, let's look at the, the average producer who's producing corn and soybean. They're producing one commodity, either corn or soybean, one of those each year. Now, look at a regenerative model. Okay, we can still grow corn and soybean, but what we're doing besides that is we're growing cover crop. And then we're grazing those cover crops with beef. Uh, on my operation, for instance, with beef, we've got pastured hogs, got pastured poultry, we've got grass-finished lambs. I'm stacking so many more enterprises. I just laugh at the notion, oh, you are not going to feed the world with regenerative agriculture. Gee, I'm producing way more nutrient-dense calories per acre than the industrial mindset is, plus it's a wider variety. The the answer becomes we can't feed the world with the industrial mind. We can produce enough commodities, but we can't produce nutrient enough nutrient-dense food. We can do that with the regenerative mindset because we stack so many more enterprises per acre. And therein lies the big difference that nobody takes into account. They only look at monocultures because they have that that uh, mindset that we got to look at one single thing. And we got to look at the ecosystem as a whole. We got to look at all the stacked enterprise, we're going to produce way more calories, nutrient dense calories per acre in a regenerative manner. That's incredible. That's exciting. That's exactly what I've been observing with growers that we have worked with as well. And uh, I wanted to hear your perspective. On that. So that, that to me is incredibly inspirational because it gives us a great deal of hope for the future. And, and when we think about the opportunities that exist and the potential that exists to really develop an agriculture ecosystem that can not only regenerate soil health and and plant health and, and all these various pieces, but that can also, where we can also begin having a legitimate conversation about growing food as medicine and really helping to improve the health of the consumers who are consuming the food that we're producing. You're exactly right, John. You know, there there's a new book was just for, that just came out this past year, What's Making Our Children Sick? And it was wrote by two doctors, and they take a look at at what's happened to the health of society, particularly in the United States, uh, over the past 50 to 70 years. And it's all the, the, the real decline in human health has come about 
about when we changed the production model from one of these very, very diverse farms that you talked about were once in Iowa to the industrialized mindset. And and as I mentioned earlier, I think a lot of it is tied to the health of and function of our ecosystems. And, and so it's to everyone's benefit, the producer, the farmer, a rancher, uh, when they diversify and, and start stacking more enterprises, it's to their benefit because it's going to increase profitability for them. And it's inevitably to the benefit of society as a whole. And we haven't even started talking about, you know, healing our watersheds and the problems, you know, water is becoming a larger and larger issue throughout the world. And, and uh, you know, those ecosystem processes will be healed also as we change from the current production model. Absolutely. Gabe, as you have developed these systems and, and if your thinking has evolved on your farm over the decades, what has been something that has really puzzled you on your operation? Well, one of the things that, that puzzles me, you know, we're we're blessed. We get we get thousands of visitors coming to our ranch during the it's amazing. They don't they never come during the winter to North Dakota. It's always during the <laughs> summer. But we we you know, we've had visitors from twenty two foreign countries and all fifty states the past five years and every Canadian province. So we get a lot of visitors from all over and they, they come thinking, you know, they, they have in their mind that it's gonna be this utopia. Well no, I'm I've got a working farm and ranch like everybody else and we have issues that we deal with, and and uh, one of the big ones that I've I've struggled some with is perennial wheat. And obviously, as we move from an annual cropping system, uh, uh, by that I mean one that was high use of synthetics. I should have said a, a conventional type cropping system to more of this regenerative model. The annual weeds are no longer an issue. They, they just don't bother us much. But it's the perennial weeds and trying to get that puzzle figured out. Now, I really believe that the work that Dr. David Johnson is doing at New Mexico State University with the high fungal component in his soil is going to be one of the keys to um, to figuring out that puzzle, so to speak. And I have been a big proponent for many, many years on we have to get away from these bacterial dominant soils. We've got to get the fungal activity back into our soils. But Dr. Johnson has helped me realize that it's even more important than I thought. And so uh, I'm happy in that uh, our soil health folks was able to hire Dr. Johnson as a technical advisor, and he's doing some work with us to teach us uh, just what he's doing with this static compost, high fungal activity, and it's really is showing some promise on uh, being able to uh, mitigate these perennial weed issues. So that's one of the things that that has puzzled me the most. And I, like everybody else, you know, I, I'm very, I'm very, very um, cognizant of the fact that I am farming still a degraded resource. You know, I tell people I've been on thousands of operations all over the world, and I've never been on a single operation, including my own, where the resource isn't degraded. So there's something to learn for all of us. And and you know, it's just like a big jigsaw puzzle. We're learning all the time trying to trying to fit pieces together. Yeah, and of, and of course, thinking about developing fungally dominated soils, you have a substantial advantage in that you've developed a system that incorporates a lot of perennials where you have you have an environment that can foster the development and the preservation of fungal communities in the soil profile, which is a critical element that may be missing on a more conventional farming operation. Right. That, that's right. I, and I tell producers, you know, producers are, and it's human nature to have a million excuses. Where Wherever I travel, people, you know, I get many, many people coming up to me, but Gabe, you don't understand. But Gabe, you don't understand. Our soils are different. Our climate's different. Yes, it's different everywhere. But one thing, the principles of healthy ecosystems are the same everywhere in the world where we go, you know, where there's production agriculture. The other thing producers just tend to not understand is that they can influence how those ecosystems function by their management. And every ecosystem all over the world has its unfair advantage. You mentioned some of the unfair advantages I have being located in North Dakota. You know, I just did a school in North Carolina. They have unfair advantages in that their growing season is much, much longer than I am than mine, obviously. So they can cycle more carbon, you know, than, than I can in any given. Now, due to their moisture, they're going to cycle through that carbon. But, 
you know, faster, but they can grow more things, so they can compensate for that. No matter where we are in the world, we have unfair advantage, and it's up to us as producers to find those unfair advantages and then use them to our benefit. Exactly. What has been something that has surprised you? Uh, the the One of the most surprising things was in 2003, I was very blessed in that Dr. Chris Nichols came to work at the ARS station in Mandan, North Dakota, about 20 miles from my place. She came out to my place in 2003, saw what I was doing, and she said, Gabe, you've come a long way. Your soils have improved significantly, but you will never truly be regenerative until you significantly back off or eliminate the use of synthetics on your operation. So what I did there, you know, I'm pretty I'm pretty gullible person and that if a person really comes across credible to me, I am going to uh, either try and prove them right or wrong. So after Dr. Nichols was here, for four years, I did split trials and realized our soils had advanced quite a bit. But I did split trials, different rates of, of synthetic fertilizer, and then all the way down to zero. And I was amazed at the production of cash crops I was able to get, and cover crops for that matter, in the form of biomass, I was able to get without the use of those synthetics. The other thing that really struck out to me was on the, the feed fields where we were not using the synthetics, the aggregation of the soil just advanced very, very rapid. We noticed we were building more soil aggregates. Of course, you build more soil aggregates, you can have better water infiltration, you got a home for biology, etc. So it, that really surprised me that, that I was actually decimating, so to speak, my soils by the use of all these synthetics. And so I learned and know a great deal to Dr. Chris Nichols for challenging me, me back then. And our soils took a giant leap forward because we, we tried those split trials then for four years. So we haven't used any synthetic fertility, pesticides, or fungicides since 2007. We still occasionally use a herbicide, but but uh, uh, not near as often. So, so that's one of the things that, that really sticks out to me as a major turning point for our operation. That is quite incredible. And and I guess just for clarity, one of the questions that I have when you when you talk about synthetics, particularly synthetic fertilizers, uh, what what had been the synthetics that you were using? Are you think are you describing things such as uh, anhydrous ammonia, potassium chloride, or soft mm-hmm. fertilizers? Mm-hmm. What do you yeah, describe? yeah, yeah. We were not using any anhydrous ammonia. We were not using any liquid forms. It was all dry forms of of uh, of synthetic fertilizers. So like urea and DAP, etc. That's what we were we were using uh, simply because of our equipment was set up for it. That, but what we really noticed was, for one thing, we were we were significantly over applying nitrogen, and of course that was burning through the carbon, you know. And then we just it was it was uh, destroying aggregation. The other thing was we were over applying phosphorus, which is done virtually all over the world. You know, we're over applying the phosphorus, which is having a negative impact on mycorrhizal fungi. Mycorrhizal fungi, of course, treat bromelain, which is critical for the formation of soil particles. So that's why that combination there is why we notice such a significant improvement in the aggregation of our soil when we remove. Now, am I sitting here today telling producers, oh, you should all quit using synthetics? No, don't. You're going to have a wreck if you do. You know, our soils are like drug addicts. We got to wean them off of these synthetics over time. The beautiful thing today is we're able to do that. And thanks to tests such as the Haney soil test, it gives producers the confidence to to really see just uh, uh, how much nutrients they can have in their soils be, be converted from organic to inorganic via biology. And so there's huge advancements being made in soil testing and how nutrients move through the system via biology that we're able to more confidently do this and show producers, okay, let's start weaning off slowly over time and get the health back into your soil. And that's the one piece that we tell growers in our consulting work is they 
they need to earn the right to both discontinue the use of fertilizers or slow down the use of fertilizers, and also to discontinue the use of fungicides and insecticides. That is, I, there's tremendous potential to grow plants that are extremely disease and insect resistant, but you kind of have to earn the right to get there, and uh, it doesn't happen overnight. That's very well said and, and very true. Look at the work Dr. Jonathan Lundgren, you know, the, the paper was just released where where and peer reviewed that that regenerative farms and ranches much much more profitable while improving their ecosystem as compared to those that are using in this case it was uh, stack grade corn genetics yeah exactly Gabe what do you believe to be true about modern agriculture that many other people don't believe to be true I believe that look when today when the producers go out and buy say a combine or a tractor or a new pickup. They get an owner's manual, right? They get an owner's manual, you know, you're supposed to read it, etc. We're never giving that for soils. We, When we go out and buy land or rent land, we're not giving, giving an owner's manual. Too many producers look at their soils as simply a, a, a medium to hold a plant upright. They don't realize that soils are a living, dynamic, very resilient uh, ecosystem. And they don't realize the power of soil life, the power of photosynthesis. I'm often asked by people who come to my place and when I speak at conferences, what's the one thing you do on your operation that sets you apart from your neighbor? And I tell them, I have a living, growing root in the ground as long as possible throughout here. It, it just, you know, <laughs> and you've done the same thing, John. You you travel to these conferences and workshops to speak, and you drive for hundreds of miles. Well, let me give you this example. In October, I had to drive uh, 652 miles to speak in western Montana. This was in October. How many green growing crops did I see in October from Bismarck, North Dakota to Butte, Montana? Once I left my place, the answer was one. I saw one field that had a green growing crop on it that was taking CO2 out of the atmosphere through photosynthesis, making all these carbons and, and molecules and pumping that into, it wasn't making carbon molecules, but it was converting it to liquid carbon, pumping it into the soil. We as producers do not realize the power of the natural system. And if we would just give nature half a chance, she's very resilient, and we could heal our soils, put more dollars in our pocket, plus produce a more nutrient-dense food. You know, and that's what frustrates me, is just too many producers have blinders on. They think it's all about uh, federal farm programs, and I get a kick on what's happening at the current moment as we're recording this podcast. You know, there's this quote-unquote tariff for uh, war going on with China, I just laugh because that'll have absolutely no bearing on Gabe Brown and his operation because we've made ourselves resilient to that because of what we've done to heal the ecosystem. You know, producers don't realize that just how much uh, of their profitability revolves around this living dynamic ecosystem and that they can heal it if they give nature half a chance. That is the one piece that I'm so excited about and I speak a lot about at conferences is harnessing the power of the photosynthetic engine. Having living growing plants is really the only way that you have of bringing new energy into the system and bringing new energy to a soil profile. And it's such, it's so incredibly powerful. We we don't even know, most growers don't even know and have no, they have never had the opportunity to observe truly healthy plants that are photosynthesizing at max capacity. And if we can just harness that photosynthetic engine and tap into that, that has such incredible possibilities for regenerating soil health and producing extraordinary crops. There's tremendous untapped potential there for everyone. You're absolutely right, John. You you hit the nail on the head there. Ray Archuleta always poses the question when he presents to groups, is your farm or ranch being run on ancient sunlight or new sunlight? Are you one that's using high amounts of carbon in the form of fossil fuels are you harvesting energy with growing plants and like like ray always says if we could just get producers cover their fields and grow things and then significantly back off on the tillage aspect so that carbon can cycle through rather than being released from 
from a tillage pass, we could take care of a lot of the issues that we're seeing in production agriculture today. This isn't rocket science. It's been done for eons of time. And when you talk, John, about the carbon, you know, the, the potential and the energy being brought in through photosynthesis, then the livestock come into play because when a livestock grazes one of these cover crops, a living plant, that plant then is going to start pumping more carbon into the soil, thus improving the carbon cycle even more. So that's where livestock integration can advance soils to another level. Absolutely. What do you think is the biggest opportunity in agriculture today? The biggest opportunity I see in production agriculture is going to revolve around advancing your soil health to the point where you can truly uh, produce more nutrient-dense foods because we're seeing a real trend in, well, it's worldwide, but particularly in this country where producer, uh, excuse me, consumers are starting to think of food as health. You know, look at the amount of, of medicine prescription that are being used today. There is a shift occurring where consumers, you know, it was called pill for ill medicine. You know, they wanted uh, uh, doctors were prescribing just pills. I think last statistics I heard were, don't quote me exactly, but it's something like 800 and some prescriptions are being rolled per thousand individuals in this country. That's absolutely ridiculous. Instead of doing that, consumers are starting to realize that food is health and what they eat directly dictates how healthy they are. I had the good fortune of spending a day with Dr. Daphne Miller. Dr. Daphne Miller wrote the book. She's a She's a family practitioner who wrote the book, uh, Pharmacology. And she told me she firmly believes 95 approximately percent of illnesses that people have can be cured or prevented just through what they eat. So as a producer out there, why would I not want to take advantage of this? Why would I want not, not want to offer products that are high in nutrient density? And then I'm going to be rewarded for it. I'm going to charge. Gabe Brown's a cap. Capitalist. I, I make no excuses for what I'm charging for what I'm producing because I'm the one out there putting my capital on the line every year doing these practices that are necessary to ensure that what I'm producing is nutrient dense. Well, consumers there are, have already proven to me they're willing to pay for it and they'll write the check for it because they know that it will have a positive impact on their health. So I think that's the one thing that more producers need to look at. And I really think we're going to see that trend accelerate rapidly in the near future where consumers are going to search out, find the producers who are producing nutrient-dense products under regenerative practices. And then they're going to vote with their buying dollar where and who they want to purchase from. Yeah, I see that happening already as well, particularly in the food and vegetable product space. And it's, it's just going to continue to accelerate. I think you're absolutely correct. Yep. What is What is a book or resource that you recommend most often to growers? Yeah, there's two of them right now that I, I'm really recommending. One is a soil owner's manual by John Stick. John Stick is a retired NRCS soil health specialist here in North Dakota, and he wrote a wonderful, it's a, it's a short read, very easy read, just outline the principles of soil health. And I, I hand out copies wherever I go of that book because it's a way that, that producers can sit down and it's, it's not overwhelming to them and look at, you know, get the ideas in their mind of what they need to do to regenerate their resource. The next book I've been recommending lately here is the one I mentioned earlier, What's Making Our Children Sick. And I do that kind of as a shock factor because, as I said earlier, I don't think we as producers really realize the impact we're having on society by what we're doing and produce. And so, like I said, I think it's up to all of us to look in the mirror and, and realize, you know, what we're doing may not be what's best, not only for ourselves, but for society. Yeah, that's awesome to have, uh, to actually have a soil owner's manual, because that's what you were describing we need earlier. So, yep. Please. On that note, uh, I am just going through the editing process on a book of my own, so I'll shamelessly put a plug in here. Uh, my book's going to be released in November. It's, it's going to be entitled Dirt Soil. And it's just going to be a read on our family's journey through the over the past.
past 20 plus years as we've moved into these regenerative practices. It's not going to be a real uh, 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 soil owner's manual type of book, how-to book. It's going to be just more of the story. And then I'm going to use examples of, of uh, what I learned, you know, through all the mistakes I've made over the past 20 plus years and give stories about how uh, certain people influenced my lives and, and what uh, what I took away from that and how I used it to, to build the ranch we have today. That's awesome. Dirt to Soil by Gabe Brown. Do you have any idea where it will be available? It'll be available through Chelsea Green and then we'll have it on our Soil Health Consulting website and, and uh, I'm sure it'll be out in, on Amazon also. Absolutely. Awesome. What technology and ideas are you really excited about for the future of that? You know, I tell people, if they get to know Gabe Brown, Gabe Brown is not a very intelligent person. I have a pretty good <laughs> sense think, of observation. I think, there might be, I think there might be some debate about that. <laughs> Well, I appreciate that, but I'm really not. I, I'm I am observant, and I'm able to look at things. And I tell producers this, as I said earlier, I'm on hundreds of operations every year all over North America, and I love going to people's farms and ranches. I can always learn something everywhere I go. And I think we've lost the power of observation. I think sometimes we look at technology as a cure-all. You know, us as producers, it seems we want to rest apart. We want to know if we apply this, this pesticide, this seed treatment, and then put this seed on back crates at this time and apply these to uh, uh, fertilizers and chemicals, then we can combine X amount. Regenerative ag is all about observation and about understanding what is happening in our soil. And it amazes me, and I'm sure, John, you will you will agree with this, how many producers never take a shovel and look at their soil? You know, I will guarantee you I have dug in several of my neighbors' soils more often than they have. You know, they just never do. They don't think of looking at it. Now, you ask what technology is coming about that I'm excited about. There is leaps and bounds being made in the knowledge of soil biology right now and the instrumentation, etc., to analyze just what this biology is doing. And, and, you know, Dr. Chris Nichols, who's one of the world's foremost soil microbiologists, will tell you she used to think she knew 1% of what was going on in the soil. Now she realized she knows one-tenth of 1%. So that shows you the amount of learning we have yet to do. So I think uh, the technology as far as, as just understanding these soil microorganisms, that's one thing I'm excited about. Another one I am really excited about from a consumer standpoint is the Bionutrient Food Association is working on a instrumentation that consumers will be able to have and they'll be able to go into any grocery store, farmer's market, etc., scan a food item and then the nutrient density of that item will be measured and available. And I think that is just going to, they're, they're hoping by 2020 that that will be available. I think that will be game changing because consumers, given a choice, they are going to purchase the higher nutrient dense product if it's within reason price wise. Well, as consumers are more educated about food as health, I think that'll drive real change on the landscape too. Because all of a sudden, farmers, you know, boy, their their product isn't selling. Well, it's way lower in nutrient density. They better start making changes to their management in order to positively affect soil ecosystems. So I think that's just huge uh, in what's going to be done there. Third thing, as far as technology, uh, there's been some real advancements in the in being able to measure exactly how much carbon we're cycling through our system. I'm working with a group now called Landstream and Dr. John Norman, who helped develop uh, uh, m- much of the instrumentation that's being used by NASA, is is a key player in that organization, along with Abe Collins. And uh, they're looking at real-time data, how much carbon sunlight is, is being collected over the landscape, and then they're going to be able to project out growth of 
plants, biomass, and it'll really help grazers. They'll be able to predict how much forage they'll have available at any given time. And then it'll be able to uh, help grain producers look at, okay, how much carbon cycling in the system, uh, how much growth will they get out of these plants, how much production, et cetera. So there's some pretty exciting things that are in the work. Gabe, throughout this conversation, you've, you've mentioned so many different ideas that farmers should consider, things that they should consider looking at and possibly working on. There, there was almost the opportunity for a bit of confusion for people who are just approached asking the question, well, where do I begin and where do I start? Yeah. What, are, what are the first actions that you would recommend the growers to take? Yeah, and, and that's a great question. And, and you're absolutely right. A lot of times people are just overwhelmed by it. Well, it all comes back to, to the five principles, you know, and what can they do on their operation? First thing I tell producers is they need to educate themselves. You know, with internet technology today, it's very easy to educate yourself through YouTube videos, you know, and through Audible, through books as you're in the tractor. Look at that as school and learn something, you know. One of the, the things that I'm fortunate is just I have this just desire to learn as much as I can. So I try, I read on the average two books a week, you know, and, and listen to more than that. I just can't get enough information. So I encourage producers to learn and then apply the five principles. I tell them, take one field, whatever will allow you to sleep at night, whether it be five acres or I had one producer who took 8,000 acres first year and moved into regenerative practice. Whatever allows you to sleep at night, commit yourself that field for five years and say, for five years, I'm going to try these principles. And then those principles are simply least amount of mechanical or chemical disturbance possible, armor on the soil surface. So we don't want bare soil. That's not, you know, nothing growing. We're not collecting sunlight. Third principle, of course, is diversity. You know, we, we need diversity. These ecosystems were, were very, very diverse. I always tell the story about how my son taught rangeland management at the local community college for five years. He brought his students out to one of our quote unquote native pastures. And in two hour time frame, they collected over 140 different species of grasses, forbs, and leggings. That's diversity. Now, what are we doing today? Oh, we plant corn and beans. Okay. Now, which is going to be a healthier soil ecosystem? Fourth principle, we talked about this earlier, living root in the ground as long as possible throughout the year, collecting sunlight. That's what it's about. Fifth principle, animal integration. And I would add insects on there, although insects are animals, because we don't realize the benefit that insects provide to the ecosystem. So to have a producer try these five principles on a given field for five years. I've never had anyone go all five years and then go back to the old way they were doing things. I've had them drop out after a year or two because they just didn't have the will and fortitude to stick with it, but I've never had them go all five years. Usually by year three, they're changing their entire their entire operational you know. And there's one other thing, one other advancement, John, I just want to mention briefly here that I think is really important is we need to get perennials back into our systems in one way or another. For those who live a bit further south than you or I, I see that as being more of a, what uh, Colin Sice in Australia terms, no-kill cropping, where you have a perennial growing uh, at all times, and then you're actually no-tilling your cash crop into that. It's being done successfully in Kansas. Producers such as Shay New are doing this now, where he has perennial growing uh, uh, paddock, and then he's no-tilling, and they they are cool season. He's no-tilling warm season species in there, such as grain sorghum, etc. That is just key because you have that living root at all the time in the soil, and then as that cool season shuts down, you seed the warm season cash crop. Best of both worlds. I've had the good fortune of being over on Collins Ice Place in Australia several times, and to me, that's the ultimate cropping system right there. That sounds like next generation for certain. Yes. What is the one question you wish I would have asked? Oh, you did a good job, John. I think I think you covered you covered most of the bases. You know, it, it is. I I understand it's a bit overwhelming, but I, I to to many producers. But I tell them just try something, just do something, grow something. You know, and don't think they have to do it all. 
You know, I'm not, I tell everybody, I don't want everybody doing all the things Gabe Brown is doing. We all have our own desires, our own goals, you know, uh, uh, different uh, landscapes, different conditions. You need to do what makes you happy, you know. But the other thing is, don't ever complain to me that there's not money in production agriculture, you know. One thing that I really, really get tired of is uh, when I travel all over, I often ask question, how many of you? want your sons or daughters to come back and join the operation. Most people will raise their hand, and then I ask, well, how many of them are? Very few will. And I think that's just sad that we have an industry where we're actually driving young people away rather than inviting them in. And, you know, those of you who know my operation know that uh, my wife and I have two children and our 30-year-old son is a partner in the operation. I knew from a young age our son wanted to come back, but I made it conducive for him to come. He knew before he even got out of the college, out of college, that this operation would be his. And it wasn't because we were just handing it to him. It was because he deserved it and we were inviting him back and we allowed him from the get-go to make management decisions. You have to make it conducive for these young people and desirable for them. You know, it's pretty, you know, what young person wants to come back from college when mom and dad are struggling all the time and don't know where the next dollar comes from. And, you know, that that just doesn't make sense. We, we have to change our mindset and, and make it conducive for the next generation. Absolutely. And that and the economic piece is a big part of that. And also, I think when you talk about creating a conducive environment, um, being able to make management decisions and being able to identify something as your own. If you are going to continue working for your parents, then they're going to keep managing and running the farm for the next 40 years until they're 70 years old and you're 50. That is that is not appealing. You're, you're exactly right, John. Gabe, this has been a fascinating interview. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm very honored that you were able to share your thoughts here on the podcast. And I will look forward to having you back at some point in the future. Thank you very much. That's great, John. My pleasure. Nice visiting with you. This podcast was brought to you by a great company that I work for, Advancing Eco Agriculture, the leader in regenerative agriculture since 2006. At AEA, we believe in challenging the status quo to find more profitable and regenerative ways to grow crops. We also believe that healthy plants are resistant to pests and disease, and that to grow healthy plants, we must first think differently about agriculture, about empowering life instead of suppressing life, about regeneration versus degeneration. To achieve this, we formulate and sell products that help growers produce higher quality yield with less risk of crop failure. In short, we help growers make more money with less risk. If you aren't yet an AA customer, go to advancingecoag.com and use the code REGENERATE5 for 5% off your first order. Thank you for listening.